Good evening. Uh, my name is Justin Richardson. I'm the current president of the Iowa State Chapter of Triangle Fraternity. I'd like to thank you all for coming out to the F Triangle Fraternity last lecture series. This is the first one in a series we hope to turn into an annual event devoted to addressing social responsibilities of scientists and engineers in honor of late Randy Pausch, the original last lecturer and author of the critically acclaimed book. For those of you who don't know, Triangle was founded in 1907 and came to Iowa State in 1964. We are dedicated to developing balanced men in science, engineering, and architecture. After the lecture, we encourage you to step in the back and learn more about how to get involved with Triangle and also check out our co-sponsors, Engineers Without Borders and Engineers for a Sustainable, sustainable World. It is fitting that our speaker tonight served on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University, as did the late Dr. Posh. In his professional career, he has dedicated much of his energy to education, urging, urging students to view engineering in, a, in its social context with the ultimate goal of improving people's lives. He has been a member of Iowa State faculty since 2007 and became Iowa State's Dean of Engineering July 1st, 2009. So without further ado, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Dr. Jonathan Wickard. Well, good evening, and it is, uh, it is just a real pleasure of mine to uh, be here tonight and, and have the opportunity to uh, speak to you about uh, engineering the future. And uh, in particular, uh, it's, a, it's an honor of mine to be the inaugural uh, speaker for the uh, last lecture series. And uh, uh, the last lecture, as, as probably many of you are, uh, are, are aware, is a tradition on the, the Carnegie Mellon campus. Um, and uh, many of you probably have, uh, have read the book, uh, The Last Lecture, uh, written by uh, the late Professor Randy Pausch of uh, computer science at the Carnegie Mellon campus. The, the last lecture was, was started at, at Carnegie Mellon a number of years ago, and it uh, became a tradition on campus uh, for a faculty member to be invited to speak uh, as if it was uh, going to be their last lecture. And what would be the message that that faculty member would want to convey to the students and faculty uh, in attendance? Uh, over the, the years, that presentation uh, has been given by uh, Nobel laureates, uh, by uh, senior faculty, by junior faculty, by renowned researchers and renowned educators. And several years ago, Professor Randy Pausch um, uh, gave that presentation. And it was particularly poignant, of course, because he at the time had been diagnosed with, uh, with terminal cancer. And he gave that uh, presentation on campus. Uh, you may have seen him interviewed in the media. You may have seen his presentation on YouTube. You may have, uh, you may have indeed read the book. And it was a... a uh, indeed, uh, one of his very last lectures in which he reflected back on his life and the, the big messages that he wanted to be able to convey. And those messages are not necessarily messages about uh, equations or formulas or computer algorithms or compilers, but about the, the larger uh, lessons, the larger lessons in life that uh, students learn uh, while they are uh, on, on campus. Um, you know, tonight, uh, there is no possible way that I could live up uh, or even compare, you know, my remarks to, uh, to those of uh, uh, Professor Pausch. Uh, you know, he intended his uh, last lecture to be a presentation not just to those uh, in attendance, but indeed it was a, a presentation that he intended for his, uh, for his children to watch uh, after, his, uh, after his passing. You know, tonight I'm, I'm going to take a, a, a little bit of a, a, a lighter look. I'm going to take a look at a, a topic that I think interests uh, those of us in the room tonight, and that is the profession of, of engineering. Um, you know, engineering has a very rich history on our uh, campus. You may know that the very first diploma that was awarded by Iowa State University uh, was in the area of uh, engineering. Uh, Iowa State was founded as a land-grant university. Uh, to educate students in agriculture and the mechanic arts, the mechanic arts being at the, the time of the Morrell Act uh, being the terminology used to describe engineering. Well, in 1872, the university awarded its very first diploma uh, in the area of mechanical engineering to uh, Edgar Stanton. Uh, Edgar Stanton went on to become a professor on campus. 
He served as president of the university in an acting capacity uh, four times. And uh, he married uh, 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 Margaret MacDonald Stanton, and she became the university's first dean of women. Uh, the Stantons spent their life uh, on the Iowa State campus. And uh, after Margaret's passing and Edgar's passing, their family decided that as a tribute to their passion for Iowa State University that they would donate a set of 50 bells to the university in order to form a freestanding tower uh, with bell chimes. And uh, those bells uh, became the carillon, uh, the, the carillon that today plays the, the bells of Iowa State. The first dean of engineering, Anson Marston, actually designed the Campanile. And uh, he was a civil engineer by training, uh, designed the Campanile, supervised its construction. The story is that President Beardshire walked out of his building uh, to Central Campus, uh, pointed his finger to the ground and said, build the tower here. And the tower went up, designed by the first dean of engineering, and the bells uh, are named after the first graduate of the university, uh, also an engineer. So today the Carillon is known as the uh, uh, Margaret and uh, Edgar Stanton Memorial uh, Carillon. Quite literally, engineering is woven into the fabric of Iowa State University uh, through uh, uh, so many of our landmarks, the Carillon, the Campanile, the Marston Water Tower, even Lake Laverne was uh, uh, designed and renovated uh, by our first Dean of Engineering. So engineering is very much a part of our campus's fabric. And as we, as we you know, think about the state of engineering on our campus today, the state of engineering uh, in a national sense, uh, that is going to frame some of my remarks. And then I also want to look forward and, and ask the question, what are the challenges facing engineering? Where is it going? What will it be like uh, as, as many of the students today are reaching the pinnacle of their careers? What are some of the engineering uh, problems that they will, that they will look at? Now, let, let me just put this slide up just to make you think a little bit about how engineering impacts everybody's lives. I, I would say that you would be hard pressed to think about anything that you use on a daily basis that's important to you that engineers did not have a role in, in designing, in making, in transporting, making sure it's safe. This, this is a list that uh, uh, summarizes what I might call the game changers of the past century. You know, these are things that, that really change the way people live. Uh, in a very in a very real sense, uh, electrification. You know, can you can you imagine your life without you know plentiful, you know relatively inexpensive uh, electricity? Uh, you know that's something that engineers produce. The mechanical engineers, you know, on power plants. The electrical engineers on the on the distribution side. Uh, pennies per kilowatt hour. Uh, we think about electricity expenses a lot here on campus as we try to reduce uh, uh, utility expenses. You know, but the fact is, you go into coffee shops, you go into the airport, you, you can plug stuff in for free. Uh, what would your life be life without the benefit of, of electricity? At the bottom of the page there, air conditioning and refrigeration. Another very seemingly prosaic technology. Uh, refrigeration makes sure that we're able to have fresh food. You can get fresh produce and fresh uh, fruit. Year-round, it may be produced in a different country. It's transported 24 hours a day. We have that convenience. Our medicines are kept fresh. Our uh, national blood supply is kept fresh through refrigeration, which seems very basic, and yet it has changed our, our lives. Andrew Young, the former mayor of Atlanta, served as ambassador to the UN, said that two things contributed to the rise of the South. One was racial desegregation and the other was air conditioning. Uh, can you imagine Atlanta without air conditioning? Tallahassee, Orlando, Miami. Would the South be what it is today without the benefit of air conditioning that engineers produced, made economical, and made very, very safe in terms of the chemicals that are, that are used? You know, the airplane, again, a lot of technology there. The Wright brothers' first flight was in 1903, 66 years later, in 1969, flight moved to the point that men were walking on the moon. 
over one person's lifetime, they saw technology change by that you know, quantum magnitude. Uh, remarkable when you think about it. Water, when was the last time you thought about plentiful, clean, safe, abundant water? And yet it's engineers that are able to make it be uh, uh, so safe and really so taken, taken for granted, if you will. I think you know, many of us with our engineering backgrounds, I, I do realize I'm preaching to the choir uh, to some extent here, but, but these are technologies that uh, literally have changed everyone's lives, and yet the average person on the street doesn't realize uh, the fact that there is so much technology, so much innovation, uh, so much expertise uh, behind those. Engineering is sometimes called the stealth profession. It's pervasive. My watch, the machines that make the fabric in my clothing, the machines that make the contact lenses I'm, I'm wearing, uh, all of the things here in this room, engineers are involved in making these products that improve our lives, and yet the public by and large doesn't really know what it is that we do. A Harris poll had the survey that you see up here on the screen. I find these statistics to be shocking. The fact that almost two-thirds of adults feel as though they don't really know what it is that engineers do. And a shocking 78% of women surveyed on the street would say that they don't know what engineers uh, do. Engineering brings great value to our society, but not in a very visible manner. Now, when I talk with engineering students, I oftentimes ask them, why are you studying engineering? What, what, what prompted you to want to go to college and to, and to major in engineering? When I ask that question of, of women engineering students, I find that I very frequently get, get two kinds of answers. The, the first answer I'll get is that I have a family relative. I have a, 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 a close relative that lives in my house or an aunt or an uncle or a cousin who's an engineer. And I know what they do and so I'm interested in it. The other remark that I'll hear from women students is that I had a a class, I had an experience. I, I participated in first Lego League. When I was in elementary school, an engineer came to class and, and told us a little something about what she did in her career. And there was that one moment that I remember that piqued, that piqued my interest. So I would ask the question, how will our nation be able to attract young men and women into the engineering profession, how will we be able to meet the big workforce needs that our nation has in science, engineering, mathematics, and technology if the average person on the street doesn't really even know what our profession uh, is? Other disciplines, and I, and I know that Triangle is open to architects, engineers, and scientists, I would argue that other professions, and chemistry I would hold out as a shining example, does a very good job of explaining their professions. The American Chemistry Council has run this ad campaign, which you may have seen either on television or in, or in print media, the Essential Two campaign. And, and they make the case that chemistry is a profession that improves lives. So, you know, if you want to protect babies who are born prematurely and help them grow and become healthy, chemistry is there for you. If you're interested in saving people's lives in car accidents, chemistry is a profession that's available to you. If you like puppy dogs and you want to see them be happy, chemistry is there for you. Well, look, I'll give the chemist the puppy dogs, all right? But let's, let's you know, um, uh, note that engineers play a role in these things as well. I, I look at that incubator and as a mechanical engineer, I see it as a heat and mass transfer problem. Uh, somebody has to make it. it and I see people nodding around the room. I look at that airbag and I say, well, that's a combustion problem to burn the sodium azide and have the propellant and make the bag. I, I see it as a sensor problem in terms of the uh, accelerometers in the, in the vehicle and the microprocessors that have to deploy that airbag. Engineering is not out there as a national profession in the public mind. Uh, we don't see ads like this in Newsweek, but other professions are out there. I say somewhat tongue-in-cheek that nothing would do more to raise public awareness about engineering than to have a good television show that would have some characters in it that were, that were sort of fun, good-looking, you know, engineers that you kind of wanted to be around. 
uh, the crime show uh, CSI. Well, after that show came out, everybody started enrolling in forensic science programs uh, around the country. Gray's Anatomy does great stuff for the medical profession. Both are perceived as professions that solve problems and help people and make the world a better place. Law and Order, boy, all the, all the lawyer shows. Um, you know, and I'll say other professions maybe that, that uh, you wouldn't normally think about, they get good press. There's a TV show called LA Inc. It's about tattoo artists. Iron Chef, all these cooking shows. It, it looks like pretty fun to be a, pretty fun to be a chef. There's TV shows about ice truckers, about, about people who mine logs in swamps, and yet you don't really see, you know, Mythbusters might be an example, perhaps, of some engineers or scientists. Let's give it that. But you don't, you don't really see out in the public eye the engineering profession doing what it can to promote the profession as one that, one that really solves problems and helps people. The public tends to think of uh, science as the solver of the big problems. When I speak with high school students and I ask them, well, you know, why are you interested in coming to Iowa State and, and studying engineering? I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, why, why are you uh, interested in pursuing engineering? The standard answer I'll get would be, well, I'm good in math and science. And uh, because I'm good in math and science, you know, I, I think I want to come to Iowa State and study engineering. And that's a, that's a great start because we know that math and science are, are enablers of engineering, but we also know that engineering has that creation aspect of it, and that engineering is actually about building things and, and making things, using math and science as tools to more efficiently design and build all of these game changers that I spoke about earlier. But the public tends to think about discoveries and, and scientific discoveries and the top 100 scientific discoveries, and there's the science channel, and it's very, very exciting they think of scientific discoveries, but then they think of engineering disasters. Uh, go to the History Channel. The History Channel has a whole series of stuff called engineering disasters. Uh, this is a plane crashing because the hydraulic system failed. Uh, there's engineering disasters in the space program, uh, buildings falling down, bridges collapsing. And this engineering disaster, I, I also want to point it out, it's an engineering disaster brought to you by Samsung. They're so proud of the engineering disasters that companies are willing to sponsor uh, engineering disasters. <laughs> I find that remarkable. E engineers are seen in the public eye as, as sort of tragic in some sense. Um, we, we might not have our own television show, but we do have our own comic strip character. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Ooh. The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. Is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. It's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. Well, you know, we, we laugh at ourselves, and it's, it's good, but the fact is that perceptions are, uh, are important. Stereotypes uh, are, are important. It's, 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 it's funny, but we also are aware that we need to be able to convey to young people, to parents, to the 78% of women on the street, that, uh, in fact, uh, engineering is something that, uh, that is a profession that one can aspire uh, to. Uh, you know, Dilbert's, Dilbert's real good. Uh, Hollywood, Hollywood gets in the act, too. Um, Michael Douglas, uh, you may have seen this movie, The American President. Michael Douglas is a politician. Um, he's nice. He's good looking. He dances uh, with Annette Bening. Uh, 
who would not aspire to be a politician after seeing Michael Douglas in a glamorous role? In, in the movie Wall Street, uh, well, Michael Douglas is no longer a nice guy. He's a, he's a crook. Uh, he's, he's a Wall Street insider trader. Um, but he's still good looking. Uh, greed is good. Well, that's, that's not a very good moral philosophy to have. He, he might look uh, a little bit awkward with that cell phone, a cell phone the size of a brick. But back in the day, uh, that was cool. You could not get much cooler than to have uh, one of those early Motorola cell phones. So Michael Douglas here, he's no longer nice, but uh, he works in the finance industry. He works on Wall Street. Still sort of glamorous and, and kind of good looking. Um, and then when he plays an aerospace engineer, uh, that's what Hollywood has him look like. Uh, in, in the movie Falling Down, he, he plays an aerospace engineer living in Southern California working for a big defense contractor. And I know, with, with apologies to my, my, uh, my colleagues in Triangle Fraternity, I know there's a bunch of aerospace engineers in the room. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a little bit of the stereotype of, uh, of engineers with the pocket protectors and, you know, not necessarily uh, somebody that, uh, that you would want to be like that, uh, that role model. I visit high schools from time to time. And, and when I do that, I uh, uh, decided once I was going to get a little bit of field data and I was going to do an experiment. So I brought three by five cards with me. And as I was speaking to a group of uh, sophomores and juniors uh, at this high school, I passed around these three by five cards. And, and really without going into my shtick about how engineering is a great profession and so forth, I just said, Let, let's do a little free association. I'd, I'd like to say, you know, when I say the word engineer to you, what, what comes to mind? What do you, what do you think about? And they filled out these cards, and this is actual, you know, this is actual measured data that I that I took. And you get the, you know, the normal nerd geek, boring, poor, poor social skills, poor communication skills, <clears throat> certainly as part of the stereotype. People I don't want to hang out with. The glasses thing. And the middle class white guy. We we speak about the importance of diversity in the engineering profession. There's a there's a number of reasons we do that. But one of which is, is, is that people with diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, r racial backgrounds, gender backgrounds, orientation backgrounds, bring new ideas and different perspectives. And we all know, anybody who's ever designed something knows that if you get in a room with people with different backgrounds and different experiences, that the design becomes better and it's, it's, better, it's better informed. We also know that our, our nation is having difficulty filling the pipeline with engineers. Um, we need more engineers in our country than we're able to produce. We need to reach out to groups who traditionally have been underrepresented in the engineering profession. And that means that the middle class white guy is not going to be the stereotype uh, in a real sense of engineering in the, uh, in the future. We sometimes play off that uh, stereotype and we may be boring dorks, but at least we have jobs. Um, and uh, the engineer shortage made simple that uh, that may be the perception, but um, in fact, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, we're no longer looking for a few good men, as, as the Marines would say, but we're looking for a few good engineers. The public's perception is, is, uh, is starting to turn around. There, there, there is, I think, a, a growing recognition of this need to address the, the image of engineers in the public's eyes. You may have seen this ad campaign. I, I think there's a banner like this hanging from the library here, uh, here in Ames. And it goes to the point that role models uh, that we know personally or role models that are presented to us through the media are indeed uh, important. The branding of professions is what I'm speaking about. When I say lawyers to you, something comes to mind. Lawyers have a reputation. There are lawyer jokes for a reason. If I say nurses to you, you have a perception of a, of, a, of a profession that is highly regarded as being very caring. Teachers, politicians, all professions have a certain brand and stereotype associated with them. And our, our profession is starting to understand that, that we're behind the curve a little bit in terms of addressing us and, and presenting ourselves to, uh, to the broader public. How many little girls are going to play with this doll and be interested in computer engineering. In October, Mattel will be releasing the Barbie 
computer engineered all. They had a survey of what job should the first Barbie in this career series be? And people could go online and vote. And they voted for computer engineer. This is a fantastic, a small thing, something that costs $12.99. I've already pre-ordered one for my daughter. I think, it's, I think this, is a, this is a fantastic thing. Uh, I would say she's, she's wearing glasses, OK? She's got that glasses thing in there. Uh, but they're pink glasses, so they're sort of cool. It points out here that she's dressed as a funky tee, all right? Still got that Barbie thing going on, but with binary code written down on it. And, that, <laughs> and that's very cool. And this is the type of thing, when I mention the conversations that I have with women who are currently studying engineering, they talk about a close family relative, or they talk about something that happened in their life many years ago that caught their interest and their imagination. The Barbie, I can be a computer engineer doll, is something in that, in that vein. Engineers, we, we, we build telephones and we build you know, power plants and we build airplanes, but we do other things. We, we know that engineering is a profession that prepares one for very diverse uh, careers. I bet you didn't know that these people were actually uh, uh, engineers by training. Alfred Hitchcock the movie Psycho, all of the thrillers. He had background in mechanical and electrical engineering. Montel Williams, a naval officer. Neil Kashkari served under the former Bush administration as assistant secretary of the treasury during the financial collapse, the real estate bubble, the market meltdown. Kashkari was on the front lines of developing the economic stimulus plan uh, that is now in effect to be able to address the uh, collapse of the mortgage uh, industry. Even, uh, he is kind of a nerd and a dork, but this guy, Bean, um, he's an electrical engineer uh, by training, uh, as is Herbie Hancock. So, you know, engineering prepares one for the standard sort of technology jobs, but I would argue that the training provided by the engineering education helps one to be a problem solver, helps one to be able to attack complex problems and break them down into more solvable pieces, enables them to be very organized and to excel in just about any profession in which you want to go. Alexander Calder, a very famous artist, you're, you're very familiar with his, his mobiles. Geometry and, and balance are central to that concept. His background was in mechanical engineering. Hedy Lamar, there are probably some people in this room know, who know who Hedy Lamar was, is. She was a, 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 actually has a, has a patent issued in 1942. She was a, an actress, obviously, but she uh, uh, had a patent issued in an area called spread spectrum communication. Uh, that is a technology that's used today for encoding digital transmissions. It's used in some cell phones. It's used in Wi-Fi systems. She uh, had a, a musician as a neighbor who was experimenting with uh, mechanical pianos that were uh, automatic pianos that would play. And this individual was interested in getting several uh, player pianos all next to one another and having them all play different music at the same time. Well, it sounded like a big mess, but inside there was a signal, was the music. And they started thinking about it, and she came up with ideas for how to encode information and to have it be scrambled across the entire musical spectrum. Her patent was issued. Uh, it was intended to be used to scramble transmissions for radio-guided torpedoes in World War II. It was used by the U.S. Navy during the blockade of Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and today it's used in the Wi-Fi system in this, in this, in this building. She was an engineer. Uh, the former chairman of Coca-Cola, did you know that uh, the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are six times more likely to have a degree in engineering than any other field, including business? Why is that? Corporations are complex. Numbers, data, information, management, engineering helps your mind to think in those kinds of uh, ways. Tom Landry, uh, a very famous uh, football coach for the Dallas Cowboys, legendary uh, in the 1960s and 70s and, and 80s. He had 20 consecutive winning seasons, put the Dallas Cowboys on the map. The, the um, 
uh, an expert in developing new formations and new training methods, would he have been so successful in organizing the people on his team if he was not an industrial engineer, skilled in the ideas of efficiency and uh, managing resources in, in an effective uh, way? These people were all engineers, and what I would submit to you tonight, view engineering not just as a technical discipline, but as the liberal arts degree of the 21st century. Our society is increasingly technological. You simply cannot be an informed voter. You could not really have any kind of uh, job, perhaps, that, that you would aspire to with a college education without having some knowledge of technology and the interplay. Uh, you cannot be a good consumer without understanding all of the megabytes and gigahertzes and so forth that you see in advertisements at Best Buy. Uh, a one terabyte hard drive for $79 at Best Buy. What's tera? What does that even mean? You need to have some technological background. And I would submit that engineering more than ever uh, now is a profession that prepares people to be uh, informed uh, citizens in the 21st century. The, the things I've spoken about here, my comments about the public's lack of awareness of what engineers do, the fact that the image and stereotype of engineers has in the past been a barrier to recruiting the best and brightest students into the, into the area, the fact that engineering is a gateway to any kind of career that you can imagine, and the, the fact that engineering has a great social value, the refrigeration, the clean water, uh, agricultural mechanization. This, this set of topics has become a consistent message, uh, a chorus, if you will, almost a crescendo that's come up in the engineering profession and engineering education field over the past 10 years or so. A variety of blue ribbon panels sponsored by the National Academy of Engineering produced influential reports, the engineer of 2020, educating the engineer of 2020, the gathering storm, which looks at the workforce uh, development issue, the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, have all recognized this, this great need. It's a, it's a national crisis, a national need to advance the engineering profession. The wind is in the sails of engineering uh, these days, and it is recognized at the highest levels of our government. Um, last year, President Obama had, had this quote when he was speaking before the National Academies. Think about new and creative ways to engage young people in science and engineering, like science festivals, robotics competitions, and fairs that encourage young people to create, to build, and invent. I love this quote, to be makers of things, not just consumers of things. The president gets it. You don't see the word engineering spoken very often by the President of the United States. Uh, this, this was an important moment. He recognizes the importance of creation, and that is a, another theme that I would like you to think about uh, tonight. The word engineering has as its root the same word that's the root of the word ingenious. Engineers don't just drive trains, all right? Uh, uh, it, ingenious is built into the word engineering and its very uh, concept. Engineers are ingenious. They create things. They build things. They make things. Every child wants to be an engineer. You put a child in a room with any set of toys, even put a child in a room with things that are not toys, and they will take them and begin building things. They will take apart furniture and couches and begin building forts. They'll take Legos and they'll make spaceships. They'll take vacuum cleaners and disconnect the things and turn them into different kinds of weapons and things. This is what children do. They want to build, they want to be makers of things. And it's our role in the educational community, in elementary, middle, and secondary school, at, at universities. It's the role of parents, it's the role of role models to let students, let young people know that if you like to make things, if you like to create, if you like to build, it's not just the math and science that draw you into engineering. It's that natural, innate thing in our DNA about building and inventing. That's why you want to be an engineer. We, we believe that here at Iowa State in the College of Engineering. We, we know that. We recognize that. That's, that's why we have programs that are directed at reaching out to, uh, to, to, to children. 
the Iowa State Engineering Kids uh, program is a, is a wonderful case in point. We, we advocate this vision of engineering as one that needs to reach out to, uh, to, to young people. The first robotics competition. Uh, how many people have walked through Howe Hall during the competition uh, and seen young people and their families? It's broadcast on the web so grandparents back in the towns can watch their grandchildren compete. Uh, the children dress up in shirts. They, they, they build things. It, it, it works. They're excited about it. It piques their interest. Those are the experiences where 10, 15 years hence, they're going to look back and say, I, I had this one thing where I built this robot when I was in Girl Scouts, and that's why I decided to become uh, an engineer. My daughter participated in one of the summer camps in this program um, last summer. And I uh, had shortly been in the dean's office, and I said to my daughter, you know, we have these camps and stuff. You're not really doing all that much during the summer. Why don't you come over and do one of these camps? She was eight years old at the time. She said, well, you know, who will my teacher be? Well, I know the other kids in the class. You know, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I don't, I don't really know, but just come and do the class. I'm, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. She said, well, I don't really want to do it, you know. And I said, well, you'll learn about what engineers do. You know, it might be fun. And she says, I already know what engineers do. She says, I don't need to come and take this class. I know what engineers do. This is a girl about this tall. She says, I know engineers make things that help people. And I said, all right, well, you got the message because you're the daughter of the dean of engineering. But I still want you to come <laughs> and do this class. And she did. And she came to my office uh, uh, the following day after she completed the camp. And she had a smile on her face as children do when they've done something that they're very proud of. And she said, um, I programmed a robot today. I said, well, tell me about it. She says, well, the first time I did it, the robot went off to the side and it went out of bounds. But then I kept working on it, and when I was done, I got it to go straight and stay in bounds. And I said, well, you know, Rebecca, you learned something very important today. And you learned the fact that engineers keep working at it, and they iterate until it finally works the way they want it to. And that, in and of itself, is a very important um, lesson. I'd like to turn and say a few thoughts on the sort of the present state of engineering and, and where we here at Iowa State uh, see, see it going. And, and in order to think about the future of engineering, where it will be when many of you are at the, the peak of your career, uh, let, let's reflect a little bit on where engineering came from, sort of from a historical standpoint. How did we get to this present state uh, that we're in uh, right now? You know, at, at the very fundamentals, uh, engineering traces itself back really to, to two area, areas that uh, in the day were, were known as military engineering and civilian engineering. Uh, military engineering involved the constructions of, uh, of roads to move troops, uh, involved the construction of uh, trebuchets and other, other artifacts of war, um, uh, metallurgy, uh, of course the metallurgy of, uh, of swords and, and, and fighting tools over the, over the ages is, uh, is, is legendary. And military and civilian engineering basically gave rise into the branches of civil engineering and, uh, and what we know today as mechanical engineering. And then from, sort of from a genealogical standpoint, mechanical engineering then gave rise to uh, electrical engineering as uh, electrical power became uh, better understood and, and uh, became a specialty in its own right. Materials engineering, aerospace engineering, uh, manufacturing engineering, and, uh, and so forth. The, the educational model that's existed in the country sort of post-World War II has been heavily uh, invested in the Carnegie Plan in which the uh, profession of engineering was broken down into uh, fundamental uh, uh, components, uh, broken down into almost scientific disciplines, the, the term engineering science, the study of solid mechanics, the study of fluid mechanics, the, the study of control theory, uh, generic uh, uh, fundamental building blocks, if you will, that could be applied into many different uh, areas. What, what we've seen in the past several decades is probably a greater awareness of the, the what I will call use-inspired aspect of engineering. The uh, uh, applications are becoming increasingly important. Students are interested in pursuing engineering professions in order to address particular problems, to be 
uh, educated in a discipline, but be able to practice in a particular uh, technological area. And it gives, gives rise to a, a, a notion that I, I would refer you to in this, in this book, a really excellent little read by uh, Donald Stokes uh, out of the Brookings uh, Press, a, a book called Pasteur's Quadrant, which is a, a really interesting look at the, at the topic of, of science and engineering and, and discovery and invention. And, and in this book, Stokes recognizes this tension, if you will, that has historically existed in the, in the, uh, in the United States uh, about science and about engineering. And the, the title of the book r refers to this, this grid in which you can imagine one axis may be uh, the level of fundamental understanding and the other ax axis is the, the practicality or the, or the use or the application of that technology. Um, the, the, the concept is that discovery that bridges fundamentals with application is where the rubber hits the road. And I, and I would argue that, that that's really the definition of engineering. Uh, in this book, Stokes uses Bohr and Pasteur and Edison as, as examples um, in, this, in this regard. Uh, Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize. Uh, he had foundational discoveries in the fields of atomic theory, atomic structure, and quantum mechanics without, without application. Niels Bohr didn't know that he's going to study quantum mechanics so that your iPhone can, can process information real quickly. He, he didn't know about semiconductors. He, he didn't know about quantum computing. But he was interested in the fundamentals without, without regard to what those applications may one day be. Um, Edison was really on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, Edison had over 1,000 US patents. He had the quote, 1% uh, inspiration, 99% perspiration, the Edisonian approach. Just keep trying different stuff. Eventually, you're going to find something that works. The, the quintessential individual, not really so deeply interested in the fundamental understanding, but very driven by practical stuff, uh, movies and recordings and light bulbs and all the other uh, myriad of inventions that Edison discovered. Pasteur is regarded by Stokes as somebody who really struck the right balance. Pasteur developed the germ theory of disease. He was a founder of the field of microbiology, obviously led to pasteurization. Uh, the vaccine for rabies and other, other diseases. Uh, an excellent blend of fundamental knowledge uh, inspired by a very practical use. And, and I would say that, that that concept of the balance between application and fundamentals is, is really today what we see as the definition of, uh, of engineering. Industry is increasingly based on science and science is increasingly based on advanced technologies. And I, I see this uh, application-driven science, this application-driven engineering as uh, a really a definition, a paradigm, if you will, for engineering in the 21st century. The National Academy of Engineering has, has recognized this with the work that they did a number of years ago in defining what they call the grand challenges for engineering. Um, you, you can read some of these things on the, on the slide, but the, the National Academies came together and said, in the 21st century, what are the big problems that will need to be addressed? And those big problems will need to be addressed by, by engineers. These are the issues of the future. They are very interdisciplinary. Uh, making solar energy economical, managing the nitrogen cycle, health informatics, preventing nuclear terror, personalized learning, uh, securing cyberspace, uh, access to clean water, free fusion, so forth. All of these different technologies, engineers working with scientists at the boundary of psychology for the science of learning, at the boundary of public policy. The, these are use-inspired applications of, of engineering. In the, in the College of Engineering, we, we refer to this as engineering and social context. We, we frame it in the context of something that we call the 2050 challenge. It's a, it's a theme, if you will, that our educational programs, our research programs 
are aligned with the big problems that we know, if left unsolved, will challenge the quality of life in the year 2050, when, when, when you are at the peak of your uh, careers. Uh, we see engineering not as a profession that is all about labs and problem sets, design projects. Engineering is not just about the Nyquist criterion and about the second moment of area of an I-beam. It, it, it's not about potential flow. It's not about polymers and Fortran programming. Yeah, those are parts of it. Okay, I know those are parts of it. But you do all of that because you want to use those in order to make the world a better place. You want to improve it. You want to improve lives and livelihoods through technology. The, the 2050 challenge theme. The challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. Look ahead to the year 2050. To a world of 9 billion people. And think about the critical challenges we'll face. technical expertise and social ingenuity to collaborate locally and globally. The College of Engineering at Iowa State University has a plan to meet these challenges. We call this the 2050 Challenge. Each day the College of Engineering is improving quality of life in Iowa, the nation, and the world. Our solutions are not just mechanisms and processes. They are pathways to human progress. We embrace the fundamental ideals of the land-grant institution. Education promotes economic development. A personal approach builds relationships. And a commitment to service fulfills the purpose of higher education. We combine molecular level science and cutting edge technology with practical research solutions that affect people's lives. We understand our responsibility to address long-term problems with state-of-the-art research. The engineers we prepare are more than just technical experts. They are the foundation for leadership in academics, law, medicine, industry, and government. Through foresight, knowledge, and leadership, we are creating the opportunity for a safe, productive, meaningful life today. With the promise of such a life in 2050. It's a nice round number, but it's also a, a, a time period where in the future the, the world's population will, will be in excess of, uh, of 9 billion people. And uh, you will be applying at the peak of your careers uh, the things you're learning uh, today in, uh, in school. You will be leaders of your profession in the year 2050. You're not going to be an entry-level engineer. You won't be retired. You're going to be making the maximal impact that you can. And over the course of your careers, you're going to be facing exponential growth um, in, uh, in, in so many different areas of, uh, of technology and, 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 and society. What I mean by that is that's the first hard drive being unloaded off the back of that truck by those three guys. It, it li weighed literally a ton. Those three guys couldn't even move the thing. It was IBM's first hard drive. It had a maximum capacity of five megabytes. Okay. That was a lot of storage back then. It was uh, designed in a, in a rented house walking distance from Santa Clara University. 
IBM was smart. They didn't just sell the RAMAC. They, they leased it for $7,000 per megabyte per year. $7,000 in 1950 was a lot of money. And it was, uh, it was uh, considered uh, incredible. Again, last Sunday, a one terabyte hard drive at Best Buy was $79. That's exponential growth. Exponential growth in computing capacity. You may have read the book, The Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil, sort of a, a futurist. This singularity is the term that he uses to refer to the point in time where humans' ability to design and build things uh, surpasses the ability of nature to do that. Um, this is a plot of computing capacity uh, versus time. Uh, this is historical data growing. This is computing capacity about the same as one insect. This is computing capacity about the same as one mouse, about the same as one person. Computing capacity of all people on the planet. And in the year 2050, we're sort of getting to that point where computers are having the same ability to process information uh, as, uh, as a human brain or many human brains. Over your careers, you will be practicing engineering in a time of exponential growth in computing and information, in the complexity of problems, and in, uh, in human knowledge. The city of Shenzhen is an interesting example of exponential growth. Um, there's a, a, a book I just finished reading by Greg Easterbrook called Sonic Boom. It's, it's a look at globalization, but it actually is a look at globalization with a very positive perspective on it and the way in which globalization will lead to greater freedom and greater economic growth. Yeah, times are going to be changing much more rapidly than they ever have in the past, but it's going to lead to advances in the human condition. He, he makes the case in his book that Manhattan took about a century to build and put in place as we sort of know it today. Major cities, your Atlantas and Dallases and Chicago's and L.A.'s, grew up in about 50 years or so, faster uh, pace. Uh, 30 years ago, Shenzhen was a small fishing village in China. Uh, it is the fastest growing city in human history. It has 9 million residents, uh, about the same as, as New York. Its port is busier than Los Angeles and Long Beach combined. This city grew up out of nothing in 30 years, and there are many, many Shenzhens out there. There is exponential growth in the need for improving the social condition of people on our, on our planet. And we're going to try to engineer. Engineering is working towards uh, making a difference. Engineering is all about creating new things. Engineering kind of means progress. Applying math and science knowledge to solving real world problems. Engineering means solving problems. I enjoyed the math and science aspect of it, but then I also liked working with my hands. I really want to be able not just to do something, the same thing every single day, but to really find new or improved ways to do something. Because I wanted to use my analytical and logical skills and try to help out the world by improving the technologies that they use. There are so many opportunities within and without engineering here. People that you meet on a daily basis, people that you work with, uh, they're really uh, innovative people. You get the awesome curriculum of all the different courses they offer at Iowa State. Plus, you get the benefit of being at a college that encompasses more than just engineering. One of the best things about being an engineering student at Iowa State is there's so many opportunities for things that you can do and things that you can work with. I got a chance to work on a project with John Deere where we we're analyzing uh, commercial virtual reality software. We design, build, and race solar cars. I've worked with an AFM, which is an area force mic microscope. Our program is very dynamic and it gives you time to, you know, uh, do a lot more social things and activities. You can just do something that's completely fun like dancing or playing bingo. <laughs> I've always been busy and never had a chance to stop. I'm glad I chose Iowa State. I love it here. The possibilities and opportunities are endless. So we, we, see, we see engineering in kind of this, this way. A great deal of learning goes on outside of the classroom. It's not all about the the chalk and talk lectures, but it's also 
experiences gained through research projects, through solar car, through solar decathlon, and any of the 700 other student groups on campus. Uh, inspire, engineering is about, is about creating. It's about projects and teams. Engineering is rooted in ingenuity. It's about not only building things, but also breaking things. Um, it's empowering, and it, it's across that spectrum of basic science, applied science, technology, business and investment, and uh, moving products to, to markets. The Economist is even starting to help us out in the engineering profession uh, in an article they had uh, last winter uh, talking about green technologies and green engineering widely regarded as uh, uh, an enormous uh, frontier of advance in the coming decades. The challenges of 2050, renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, manufacturing, clean water, so much of it revolves around the concept of sustainability and, and green technologies. Um, this article concluded, the final sentence was the best thing that a bright young person can do to help rid the civilization of fossil fuels is to get an education in engineering. You didn't, you didn't used to see that uh, type of press for the engineering profession. And you know, I'll close just with this, this final quote, which really, I think, sums up some of the remarks and some of the points that I'm trying to make this evening. And that is the distinction between science, uh, which is well understood in the public mindset, and engineering that we are working to frame in a more effective manner. Uh, scientists are all about the concept of discovery, uh, understanding the world as it exists, uh, investigating that which is. Engineering has built into it ingenuity, uh, creation, uh, innovation, and creating new things that have never existed. And that's what engineers do. That's what you will do in your careers as you address these major problems that uh, are facing our society now and in the coming coming decades. You know, I, I'm just going to conclude right here. I'd, again, I'd very much like to thank uh, all of the students in Triangle Fraternity. This, this has been a real pleasure of mine and, and certainly an honor to uh, have the opportunity to give this lecture, as well as uh, thanking uh, Pat Miller and Molly Helmers from the University Lecture Series. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for your very kind attention this evening. Well, I think you have a wonderful example there in the uh, in the back about some of the uh, some of the work that uh, uh, our own students are doing here uh, in learning about the issues of uh, of global poverty. Uh, the work of uh, you know Professor Mark Bryden sitting here and uh, Richard Lassar and others through their uh, courses in appropriate technology. The the growth that we've seen in the past several years of uh, engineers without borders, engineers for a sustainable world. The notion of uh, uh, students having meaningful service learning experiences through their curriculum to be able to take what they've learned in the classroom and be able to uh, apply it to, uh, to understand uh, cultures that are very different from uh, the ones we have uh, uh, here that we, that we live in. My, my niece is a, a bioengineer uh, studying at Duke University. Um, she uh, spent uh, her summer uh, in Africa last year um, very similar to the kind of program we have here uh, in Mali. Uh, this, this type of experience is uh, culturally very, very, uh, very broadening. It's, it's something we didn't used to see uh, in engineering, but is now becoming increasingly common and, and increasingly important. Um, we talk oftentimes about international experiences for, uh, for our students, and, and we have Julia Applesmith here from the uh, College of Engineering's uh, uh, International Programs uh, office. 
um, international uh, experience could be in, uh, in uh, Sweden, it could be in England, uh, it could be uh, in, in Africa, it could be in, in Vietnam. Uh, these are all uh, environments that uh, uh, have cultures very different than ours. And, and so this, this knowledge, I mean, to your point of, of poverty and, and, and cultural differences, um, differences in religion, differences in, uh, in, in, in ethnic uh, traditions, th this is something that when you're just a, a, a regional school, you might not think about as much. But at a university like Iowa State, where we're a national, we're, we're an international school, it's an increasingly important aspect of the, the kind of education that we, uh, that we have to provide. Um, you know, I, I asked once to my industrial advisory council, what are some of the things that you would like to see more of in our engineering graduates? Uh, tell us what we're doing well, tell us what we need to do more of. They, they never come back to me and say, your students need to draw better free body diagrams. They never say that your students need to be better with control volumes. And they always get those pluses and minuses wrong on the energy flow in and out of the control. That never, never is, is the sort of comment they make. They, they make a comment uh, about uh, the knowledge of other cultures, the knowledge of the world being actually a very small place in which to conduct business, um, understanding of other languages, of other, other religions. That, that cultural awareness, I think, is an increasingly important part of the experience that you need to have uh, at, uh, at a university or, uh, or through your work, uh, your work career. A great, great, great question. Um, get involved in things that uh, take you outside the confines of the typical classroom lecture experience. Right? And, and when I say that, the classroom lecture experience is great. That's an important part of learning. Okay, go to class. All right, this is the dean talking. Go to, <clears throat> you know, go to class. Take good notes. You know, sit in front, front row here is totally empty. Right. Um, one of the things that I believe makes uh, Iowa State uh, special is, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, is, is the 700 or so student groups uh, all, across, all across campus. You saw some of it in the video uh, here, the different students giving the little sales job about the sort of things that they're, that they're involved in. There's a huge amount of learning that I believe takes place in all of those sorts of uh, activities. And it's, it's things like the research projects. It's, it's hooking up as a freshman or sophomore even with a faculty member and being involved in a, in a research project, getting to work with grad students, getting to work with industrial sponsors, getting to work with a, with a faculty member. Um, a great amount of learning can take place there. Get involved in a, a group like Associated General Contractors. Um, you know, that's, that's a group based in the CCEE department. It's, it's basically Connie students. They take what they learn in the construction engineering program and over spring break, they go to New Orleans or they go to Cedar Rapids or Iowa City and they help rebuild. They help rebuild after the hurricane, they help rebuild after the floods. Um, and they come back and they speak about how that was a defining experience for them. Students in AGC will say, uh, I know that I'm gonna look back uh, on my time at Iowa State and I learned a great deal about helping people, about applying what I know um, through that experience. Solar Decathlon last year was another wonderful example. You had architects, architects, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, graphic designers, students from across campus uh, participating in that project. They, they, they built the solar house, they took it to Washington, D.C., they rebuilt it, it, it sat on the National Mall outside the Smithsonian Castle with the Washington Monument on one side and the Capitol Building on the other side. I was there. I could not have been more proud of our students or what they uh, had accomplished in building that home, which was situated right next to the home from Spain. Our students loaned energy to the, to the team from Spain. <laughs> it was a fantastic experience. I know that those students are going to remember that for their entire life. Um, those kinds of things. The, the, the teaming, the projects, um, working with others, getting to know others, the relationships so developed, 
I believe will uh, be life lessons that uh, that uh, serve students well. So so get involved in, in any and uh, and all of that. It's all out there waiting for you on a campus like Iowa State. Well, again, I'd like to thank you all so much. Uh, I wish you a pleasant evening, and I'll stick around for a few more minutes if you have any further questions for me. Thank you again. Just like to thank everyone for coming tonight, and also thank uh, Dr. John Wickard for giving this speech for us. Um, if you'd like to know more about Engineers Without Borders or Triangle Fraternity, I know we'll be sticking around after the lecture. Just feel free to come talk to us.